Tonight on PBS News Weekend, how some cities are testing no strings attached payment programs as a way to help lower income residents get a leg up. Then, the promise held by the first transatlantic flight with completely sustainable fuel as airlines work toward lower emissions air travel. And a new series looks at why some people in some parts of the world are living longer than average. They're socializing because they know their purpose and they live their purpose. They live near nature. They keep their families close by and we can map all of these to higher life expectancy. Good evening, I'm John Yang. Almost two months into the ground invasion, Israeli military officials say they're close to having what they call full operational control of northern Gaza and will soon shift their focus to southern Gaza. Israeli authorities have ordered more territory evacuated in central and southern Gaza as residents seek refuge in ever-shrinking slivers of territory. Today, the IDF released footage of fighting in Gaza City's Isa neighborhood. In another part of Gaza City, Palestinian officials say more than 90 people were killed when Israeli airstrikes flattened two buildings. Gazans said they don't understand why the buildings were hit. Was there resistance in this house? What resistance? You won't find anything but children's dolls and a floor for them to eat on. The children, you will find nothing more. Peaceful people you dropped about 100 tons of explosives on. Israel offered rare details of its controversial practice of rounding up large numbers of Palestinian men, saying its forces had arrested hundreds of alleged militants, sending 200 of them to Israel for interrogation. In Colorado, two Denver-area paramedics were convicted of criminally negligent homicide in the 2019 death of 23-year-old Elijah McLean. McLean died after the EMTs administered a fatal overdose of the powerful sedative ketamine. Police forcibly arrested McLean following a suspicious person complaint. After officers pinned him down, the paramedics gave him the ketamine. He died days later in the hospital. Outside the courthouse following the verdict, McLean's mother raised a fist in the air and wept. Some experts say the verdict could have a chilling effect on emergency medical personnel. And the Czech Republic came to a virtual standstill at noon today in mourning for the 14 victims of the nation's worst mass killing ever. Bells tolled and people across the country observed a minute of silence on a national day of mourning. The shooting occurred Thursday at Charles University in Prague. 25 other people were wounded before the shooter, a student, took his own life. Still to come on PBS News Weekend, the promise of the first transatlantic flight powered with 100% sustainable fuel. And a new documentary series looks at why people in some parts of the world are living longer. This is PBS News Weekend from WETA Studios in Washington, home of the PBS NewsHour, weeknights on PBS. It's not a new idea. No strings attached payments to provide people with a financial floor, what's called a guaranteed basic income. It actually dates back to 16th century England. Today, it's being tested in dozens of pilot programs across the country, in cities as big as Baltimore and as small as Yellow Springs, Ohio, population about 3,700. Some of them use taxpayer funds. Others use private contributions or foundation grants. Stockton, California was among the first to launch a pilot program in 2019. Earlier, I spoke with Stockton's mayor at the time, Michael Tubbs. He's also founder of a group called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. I asked him about the genesis of Stockton's program. That the crux of all the issues from homelessness to crime to education was this persistent poverty and economic insecurity. So in my first 100 days, I gathered my team in the office and I said, you guys, I want our legacy to be an anti-poverty, a pro-economic security administration. So let's come up with all the ideas for how can we as a government ensure that people have enough to live and, and survive and eventually thrive. And through that, my team came back with this idea of, of a guaranteed income, citing work that was happening in places like Kenya and in Mexico and in Brazil. And I had heard the guaranteed income from studying Dr. King in college, so I was familiar with the idea. So I said, well, let's do it. And as I understand it, the program ran for two years. You had 125 participants from neighborhoods where the median income was at or below the city's median 
which I think was about $46,000. They got $500 a month for two years. What did you find? So many people said the money would be spent on drugs and alcohol, or that people would stop working, or that people would use that money to commit crimes, et cetera. And what we saw was that people spend money the way you and I and the viewers spend money. We saw them be two times less likely to be unemployed. We saw them spend the money on things like utilities, on necessities, on the food and on their children. But we also saw health impacts. We saw those with a guaranteed income saw their stress decrease. Just a small amount of money was enough, not for people to become millionaires, but for people not to be evicted, for people to take care of their children for people to be able to pay to get their car fixed, for people to live and contribute um, to their communities. So uh, everything you just said, it sort of contradicts or, or counters what the critics say, because the critics say uh, that this takes away the incentive to work, uh, that this will foster bad spending decisions. But it sounds like that you, that's not what you found in Stockton. That's not what we found in Stockton. And increasingly, from any of the dozens of pilots happening across this country and this world consistently, which suggests to me, John, that part of the issue is not just a data issue, but a storytelling issue, that we have to get people to see the myths, the lies, the prejudices, the stereotypes, and the biases we have against people who may have less money. And what happened when the program ended? I mean, these, these people in the pilot program had this income floor. What happened when that, that was taken away? What we saw happen after it was taken away was people were able to use this money and do things to set them up to be better off than where they started. So what I mean is several people went from part-time to full-time work. So although they're not receiving the guaranteed income, they're receiving the income that comes with a better paying job with benefits. Or some people use the money to save up to pay for the deposit necessary for, for rent in a, in a better apartment. Or some people... Um, paid off credit card debts. And so folks were able to, to use the money to, to, to pay off the little things that were holding them back. So now they're in a much better position than they were um, a couple of years ago before they were part of the program. Do you see guaranteed income programs supplementing government assistance programs or replacing government assistance programs? I see it as a supplemental. I see it really as an extension of the social safety net. I, I see it as, a, as our 21st century um, social security. And when in the Great Depression, we decided that folks who are older deserve to have a little bit of cushion post-65 because they've done so much for our communities. And I also think our current government programs should take note about what makes guaranteed income works because A, it's the money, but B, it's also the trust that maybe people don't need to do a bunch of paperwork. Maybe folks don't need someone to sit down and make them come in and set goals. Maybe a lot of folks just need cash and maybe that will make some of the investments we're making as a government that much more um, efficient. Sort of along those same lines, why is it so important that these, these payments have no strings, that they can spend it on whatever they want? Because folks' finances are so volatile that month-to-month -month needs change, right? And, and for example, for folks in current government programs, if you need money for food, that's probably not the only place where you need money. We know that one in two Americans already can't afford one $500 emergency. So it's really about um, providing people the contingency and the ability to use their mental acuity to make decisions, because month to month, those needs may change. These programs, the pilot programs, some of them use government money, some of them use private donations, some of them use grant money from foundations. If you were able to make this permanent across the country, how do you think it should be funded? We are able to make this permanent across the country. And again, I think the child tax credit is, is a huge start, which is a guaranteed income, albeit for families with children. So. State governments, county governments, local governments, we're doing pilots there because those governments can't deficit spend. They have to have a balanced budget every year. Our federal government can, and we do. We can also raise revenue. We can legalize cannabis nationwide and use the tax revenue for that to pay for a guaranteed income. We could close the 2017 Trump tax cuts, which gave $2 trillion away to the riches among us. And we could close other tax loopholes and create a guaranteed income. There's no shortage of ways of paying for it. I really believe the, the question is, how do we build the wheel? How do we make it a necessity? It's a political question. And we have to organize and, and, and demand of our elected officials that 
This is what we need. And let them know this is not scary. This is not an extreme position. This is not a utopian position. This is a, a, a position that Republicans and Democrats alike are both suffering. And that's where a lot of, some of this anger we see, this, this, this raging populism we see comes from economic um, anxiety in, in, in some ways. So this is not a partisan issue, um, which is a long answer to say it's a political question, but we've been doing the work to build political will and we'll continue pushing in, until we get there. Michael Tubbs, founder of Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Studies estimate that air travel alone accounts for about 4% of human-induced climate change. And the United Nations warns that airplane emissions will triple by 2050. Last month, the aviation industry's search for ways to cut emissions took a step forward with the world's first airliner flight using completely sustainable fuel. Ali Rogan tells us what it means for aviation and for climate change. A plane running on fat and sugar. It sounds fanciful, but it's what powered Virgin Flight 100 last month. The flight was just a one-time demonstration and there were no passengers, but it was meant to show the potential of what's known as sustainable aviation fuel. On average, SAF emits 70% less carbon dioxide than standard fuel. That could make a big difference for airlines, which emit more carbon than any other form of transportation. All told, about 800 million tons of it across the industry last year. But decarbonizing these high-speed jets is slow going. Nicolas Rivero has been reporting on the issue for The Washington Post. Nicolas, thank you so much for joining us. What exactly was fueling this flight? In this case, it was a mixture of sustainable fuels that was made from waste fats and kind of plant sugars. Um, and all told, they made it about 70% less carbon than standard jet fuel would. How does this uh, type of fuel get made? So uh, sustainable aviation fuels are a really broad category of fuels that can be made from a, a lot of different sources. The main thing is they're not made from petroleum, but they might be made from crops like corn and soybean. They might be made from used cooking oil. They could be made from sewage or municipal waste. Um, the key part of their definition is no matter what they are, they're not made from petroleum and they emit at least 50% less carbon uh, than standard jet fuel. And what is needed to, to, to get this fuel made, in addition to, I would imagine, a lot of money? One of the issues with this right now is there's very little sustainable aviation fuel in the market. Uh, part of the reason for that is there's just not that many facilities that produce these fuels because traditionally they've been more expensive than standard petroleum-based fuels, and there aren't that many incentives for airlines to use them. Airlines operate on very small margins, and so uh, differences in fuel costs can make a really big difference to their bottom line. To what extent are airlines using sustainable aviation fuel already? Is it already part of the mix of energy that, that planes are using? It is part of the mix. It's a tiny part of the mix. So last year, uh, airlines used 15 million gallons of sustainable fuel, which is less than a fifth of a percent of the overall consumption of jet fuel in the U.S. So what then is, is keeping commercial airlines from using more of it? Why isn't it used more widely? What are some of the barriers to that? I mean, cost is the biggest thing. And the way that you bring down costs is you scale up production. And so there's some efforts to make that happen right now, but it has been slow going so far. Um, but governments and businesses are trying different tactics to try to ramp up some of this production. So uh, for instance, in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act gives tax credits to airlines that buy sustainable fuels to try to offset a little bit of that cost premium. In Europe, regulators are just mandating that airlines use these fuels. So by 2025, all airlines must use 2% SAF, a sustainable fuel. And by 2050, that ramps up to 70%. And then on the market side, uh, the World Economic Forum is leading an effort to create tax credits based on sustainable fuel purchases. So airlines know how much carbon they're saving based on using these fuels, and they can sell um, emissions credits to business travelers who might want to offset um, some of the carbon emissions that come from flying. What about the airlines themselves? What is the appetite for them to adopt this sustainable fuel more broadly? Airlines certainly want to use these fuels. The obstacle really is cost. So they have to be able to justify spending double or triple or quadruple the amount uh, on fuel that they're used to. 
uh, but they certainly see this as part of their route to getting to zero emissions. Now, for them to get all the way down to zero, they're going to have to use new technologies that allow planes to run on things like electric batteries or green hydrogen or some other form of fuel that hasn't been invented yet. Uh, but those technologies are going to take years to develop and decades more for airlines to replace their existing fleets with planes that use these new technologies. So in the meantime, the best route that airlines have to reduce the carbon emissions from their fuel is through these sustainable fuels that will emit something between 50% and 80% less carbon than the petroleum-based fuels that they typically use today. The trade organization for the airlines wants to reduce net zero emissions among its members by 2050. Is that feasible? And can sustainable aviation fuel get these airlines there? Based on my reporting, the experts that I've talked to think that that is an achievable goal, but one that will be very difficult for airlines to reach. So they really have to rely on some of these new technologies panning out, whether that's electric planes or hydrogen fueled planes, um, for them to reach net zero by 2050. In the intermediate time, the only route they really have to reduce their emissions in a significant way is scaling up their use of these sustainable fuels. Nicolas Rivero with The Washington Post, thank you so much for breaking this down for us. Thank you so much for having me. A lot of people do a lot of things in search of a long and healthy life. Complicated diet plans, gym memberships, and expensive dietary supplements. But in a four-part Netflix series called Live to 100, Secrets of the Blue Zone, best-selling author Dan Buettner says a lot of that is misguided. He traveled to places he calls blue zones, where more people live significantly longer than average, trying to figure out how they do it. Recently, I spoke with Buettner and asked him why he chose to start a series on longevity in a cemetery. I think it's facing the inevitable. Uh, we're all gonna get frail. Uh, we're all gonna die. But uh, when we, uh, how long we wanna be on this earth, we have a lot of say in that matter. So we started uh, at the end and, and then went back from there. When you found these blue zones, were there some themes running through all of them? Yes. If you wanna know what a hundred year old ate to live to be a hundred, you have to know what she was eating as a child and middle age and newly retired. So to get at that, uh, we found 155 dietary surveys done in all five blue zones over the last 80 years, and we averaged them with the help of Harvard. And we found that 90 to 95% they're eating a whole food plant-based diet, meat only about five times per month. And contrary to a lot of sort of keto slash paleo diet advice, it's mostly carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, which I think shocks a lot of people. When I first started writing about this, I did a cover story for National Geographic in 2005. Nobody was connecting loneliness to longevity. And I was pointing out the importance of strong social connections and social circles. And it turns out that's worth about seven years of extra life expectancy. But the big revelation, and you never hear about it because it's not sexy and marketers can't sell you things, but long, an extra 10 years of life expectancy is the sum of lots of small improvements we, we make in our lives, mostly in our environment, applied for decades. Are these blue zones in any way endangered? You talk about Okinawa now having an obesity problem, that family in Costa Rica where the young boy just wants cereal. Are these in, endangered locations? As soon as the American food culture comes in the front door, longevity goes out the back door. And I'm giving most of these blue zones a half a generation before they completely adopt our way of life and therefore start adopting our obesity rates and diabetes and heart disease rates. It's a tragedy, actually. But at the same time, you also tried to create some blue zones in Albert Lee, Minnesota and Fort Worth, Texas. What lessons did you learn from that? The big lesson is don't try to change your behavior. You'll fail for almost all the people almost all the time in the long run. You change people's environments. In other words, you design for health. Our Blue Zone projects unleash a swarm of healthy nudges and defaults that are put in place for years. They're mostly environmental, making cities walkable, policies that favor healthy food over junk food and so forth. And setting Americans up for success, as opposed to the failure our food environment portends right now, every city we work in, we've seen major improvements in people's health, and we've seen obesity drop, and we've seen 
uh, uh, health care cost savings in the, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So it sounds like it's not just personal behavior, but it's also, as you say, policies, making cities more walkable, designing you know, streets and neighborhoods like that. I have no faith, and I don't know of any research where you can change a population's health by trying to convince individuals to change their behavior or somehow imbue them with responsibility. We're genetically hardwired to crave fat, salt, and sugar and take rest whenever we want. So unless we set up our environment where it's easy for us to eat, basically whole food, plant-based, easier for us to walk than it is to drive, we're going to continue to see uh, health care costs in the trillions as we're seeing today in America. You talked also about in the uh, you know, the series about something we've talked about on this broadcast, the fact that life expectancy is becoming shorter. And a lot of it is because younger people are dying from suicides, homicides, drug overdoses and car accidents, all preventable. This, none of this is, a, is an organic problem. Did you learn anything in, in your work uh, that would relate to that? The number one killer in America is our diet. We lose about 660,000 Americans prematurely to the way we eat. If we don't take aim at that, these other things are more peripheral. In Singapore, which I dubbed a Blue Zone 2.0, individuals cannot own guns. In America, we lost 55,000 people to gun deaths last year. That dragged down the life expectancy. In Singapore, they lost two. They're very tough on drugs in Singapore. I mean, if you could be put to death for, for selling drugs in Singapore. But the other side of that equation, only 15 people died last year in drug overdoses, whereas we lost almost 110,000 Americans in drug overdoses last year or drug-related deaths. So yes, there are lots of things on the fringes, but the big thing we need to take aim at is our diet. And until we get that squared away, the rest of the stuff is rounding error. Toward the end of the series, you say the same things that help us live a long, healthy life are the things that make life worth living. Are you saying that if we concentrate on the quality of life, that the quantity of life will come? The concentrating on quality of life helps. But these uh, Silicon uh, multimillionaires shooting themselves up with uh, young people's blood and and working out six hours a day and taking all these weird pills and genetic interventions, people in blue zones are living a long time because they're socializing, because they know their purpose and they live their purpose. They live near nature. They keep their families close by. And we can map all of these to higher life expectancy. So the big point for blue zones is if you adopt the blue zones way of life, you not only stack the deck in favor of longevity, but you can be pretty sure the journey is going to be pleasurable. Did you change anything in your life based on what you learned? Yes, I become I became mostly plant based. I, I don't eat meat anymore. I used to be a, a ultra marathon cyclist, and now I do things like play pickleball and uh, take walks because I know that favors my longevity more than hardcore physical activity. I got very clear on my purpose. It's very hard to get me to do things that aren't right down the, the strike lane of, of, of my values and what I'm good at and what I like to do and how I can give back. And I've also prioritized family because I know keeping your uh, family nearby adds three or four years of life expectancy over being single and alone. The series is Live to 100 Secrets of the Blue Zones. Dan Butner is uh, the host and one of the executive producers. Thank you very much. We'll see you when you're 100, John. <laughs> it's a deal. All right. Before we go, we have just gotten word that Laura Lynch, a founding member of the iconic country music band The Dixie Chicks, now known just as The Chicks, has died in a head-on car crash in West Texas. Lynch recorded three albums before leaving the group in 1993. And that is PBS News Weekend for this Saturday. On Sunday, a look at why a record number of people across America are experiencing homelessness this holiday season. I'm John Yang. For all of my colleagues, thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow.